Dragon Age Inquisition was rated M for Mature by the ESRB and contains blood, intense violence, nudity, sexual content, and strong language. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everyone, my name is Emeronith and I play games for the internet and today we're playing Dragon Age Inquisition. Uh, last time we were going through some courtly intrigue at Halam Sharal and it's time to uh, fill in some codex entries, do another codex reading. <sighs> Starting with characters. Alistair. A hero of the recent Fifth Blight, the Grey Warden Alistair is credited alongside the hero of Ferelden with slaying the Archdemon and sparing Thetis the ravages of the Darkspawn. Rumor has it that he is an heir to the Ferelden throne, but that he turned it down in deference to Queen Enora, daughter of to the traitorous Tern Loghain. Grand Duke Gaspard de Chalons. Lady Montillon, I can offer no apology for my nephew's behavior the other night. Gaspard has never betrayed any interest in following my advice. In truth, everything he said to you at your dinner party, he has also said to me. His resentment at being deprived of the throne has festered for some time, and he was never one to accept defeat gracefully. I would take Gaspard's threats of war seriously. I do not believe my nephew knows how to resolve problems through the use of anything but steel. If his record on the battlefield is any indication, he is quite adept at so doing. I shall be increasing my personal guard directly. Sincerely, Duke Gratien. Morrigan. Monsieur. I, too, am concerned about this new advisor to the Imperial Court. If Celine is truly curious about magic, why not turn to Madame de Fer with her questions? Why seek out this dark-haired apostate from Ferelden? Why bring the woman here? After a great deal of surveillance, I can reassure you somewhat. I do not believe this Morgan has our Empress ensorcelled. There is no way to be certain, of course, but the witch and Celine argue often. If Morgan tells Celine something unpleasant, she will avoid the witch for months before curiosity draws her back. Morgan has an interest in ancient things, magic from a time before the Chantry even existed, and it is this pursuit that intrigues Celine. Morgan can answer questions that Madame de Fer either could not or would not. Whether any pertain to blood magic or other forbidden things, that I can only suspect. Three of my spies disappeared after attempting to breach the spells protecting this woman's laboratory in the depths of the palace. I would raise a fuss, but then my efforts would be revealed, even though I doubt I am alone. The entire court is consumed with curiosity, and the more Selene keeps her in the sidelines, the more we all wish to know. Our Empress plays with fire. Considering she has yet to find herself a husband to solidify the future of her dynasty, these dealings with the apostate are own oh, These dealings with the apostate are one more nail in her coffin. Yours in trust, Madame de Carnet. Mm. Warden Commander Clarel to Arl Tegan Guerin. I sought a chance to speak with you in person, my lord, in hopes of convincing you to allow us to send further aid to Ferelden, to give the Grey Wardens in your homeland a chance to rebuild. I hope this letter succeeds where my requests for a meeting have not. I understand Ferelden feelings regarding Grey Wardens. Sophia Dryden's actions were reprehensible. Grey Wardens are forbidden from interfering in the affairs of nations, save when we must exert our authority to battle the Blight. Still, even you must acknowledge the vital necessity of my order after the Blight nearly ravaged your homeland. Without the Grey Wardens, Ferelden would be a wasteland populated only by Darkspawn. I understand as well your concern that I am a mage, living outside the confines of the Circle. I have been informed that you saw magic ill-used by apostates at Redcliffe. You have my sympathy in this, but not my apology. The Maker saw fit to give me the gift of magic, along with a temperament better suited to battle than quiet meditation. 
I left the Circle legally, and the Grey Wardens gave me a chance to use my abilities to defend our land. I am no apostate. My first interest, Arl Tegan, indeed my only interest, is to see this world protected from the Blight. I may be Warden Commander of Orlay, but I am not Orlesian at heart. I am a Grey Warden, and nothing more, and I will defend this land from horrors you cannot even imagine. My oath comes before political ambition, before concerns about the rights of mages. It will one day come before my own survival. I hope to hear from you soon. Yours, Warden Commander Clarelle de Chanson. Empress Céline Valmont. My dear Viscount, I congratulate you on securing an invitation to appear at court. Allow me to present you with these three words of advice as a gift. Don't underestimate Céline. You must not mistake her reputation as a diplomat and a peacemaker to mean she avoids conflict. Dozens of her enemies that are the bottom of the harbour in Val Royale. Negotiation did not send them there. She is as shrewd and ambitious as her grandfather Judical I, but unlike him she knows how to handle the nobility. She built the University of Orlais, the most vehemently opposed project in Orlesian history, because she knew how to win the support she needed to overcome even her bitterest rivals. She can keep a pet apostate in front of the Chantry, because even the Divine fears her influence. Do enjoy your visit to the palace. Sincerely, Duke Germain. Okay, and now that's everyone in characters. Creatures. <clears throat> the Black Wolf. Updated. The scouts report activity uncharacteristic of lupine behavior. The breach and resulting rifts have caused unprecedented disruptions in the veil. Such alterations to the environment may account for the unnatural aggression. If this is indeed the case, I cannot yet say how widespread the impact. How many wolves does this environmental imbalance influence? What threat do they pose to resistant members of the pack, to the local population? This warrants further investigation. Submitted to Seeker Pentagast by Menave, Mage Apprentice and Inquisition Researcher. Researched, damage against beasts increased. Deepstalker, updated. One of the few natural non-darkspawn creatures to live in the Deep Road. The Deep Stalker is a reptilian cave dweller known for burrowing into the stone paths of the Deep Roads and ambushing prey, usually nugs. They hunt in packs, attacking with round mouths of serrated teeth or spitting poison from venom glands. Although a single Deep Stalker poses little threat to any experienced explorer, packs can be lethal. From Tales from Beneath the Earth by Brother Jenna TV. Researched, damage against beasts increased. Herlock, updated. Those who had sought to claim heaven by violence destroyed it. What was golden and pure turned black. Those who had once been mage lords, the brightest of their age, were no longer men but monsters. Thernodes, 12-1. Sin was the midwife that ushered the dark spawn into this world. The magisters fell from the golden city, and their fate encompassed all our worlds, for they were not alone. No one knows where the Darkspawn came from. A dark mockery of men in the darkest places they thrive, growing in numbers as a plague of locusts will. In raids they will often take captives, dragging their victims alive into the deep roads. Most evidence suggests these are eaten. Like spiders, it seems, Darkspawn prefer their food still breathing. Perhaps they are spawned by the darkness. Certainly evil has no trouble perpetuating itself. The last blight was in the Age of Towers, striking once again at the heart of Tevinter, spreading south into Orlais and east into the Free Marches. The plague spread as far as Ferelden, but the withering and twisting of the land stopped well beyond our borders. Here, Darkspawn have never been more than the stuff of legends. In the northern lands, however, particularly Tevinter and the Anderfells, Darkspawn haunt the hinterlands, preying on outlying farmers and isolated villages, a constant threat. From Ferelden, Folklore and History, by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. Research, damage against Darkspawn increased. Hmm. I believe 
that's all for creatures. I haven't updated my notes for the previous codex entry that I read, and I apologize. History. Uh, Orlesian Caprice Coins. Victory in the Grand Game is not merely determined by what one has at one's command, one's connections, and one's machinations, but what one is willing to give up. The clearest example is the Caprice. Each coin is traditionally a gift. There were once tokens of regard, favors for chevaliers from their lovers or patrons. Throwing them into a fountain was rooted in superstition. The token was offered as a sacrifice, a bribe to Andraste to keep the chevalier safe on the battlefield. The more one had to offer to the waters, the better one's chances of escaping the caprices of fate, hence the name. Over time, the superstitious aspect of the custom faded. Now the caprice is a mark of status. The more coins one has, the more public the spectacle of throwing them away, the stronger one's position in the game. From the Dowager's Field Guide to Good Society by Lady Al Alcyon. Hmm. Superstitions of the Royal Family the Valmont family has its quirks, every family does, but the Valmonts lean particularly toward the occult. Emperor Reveille the Mad believed in ghosts. He was certain that his mother continued to advise him after her death, and that the angry shade of his twin brother sought his downfall. He employed the services of soothsayers to convey messages from beyond the grave, and to stave off his slain brother's wrath. His son, Emperor Judicile I, had a fascination for all things ancient and arcane. It is said that his desire to reconstruct the palace of Halam Shiral, after an elven uprising destroyed it, was due more to his interest in the site itself than in politics or the game. They say he chose to spend the winter months at this family retreat because he believed the palace located at a nexus of elven magic, that spending time there would grant him longer life as with the fabled immortal elves. In the end, the palace did not prevent his death due to heart failure. His youngest son, Prince Renaud, had a similar interest in elves and the dales. He collected carvings of Hala, the dalish beasts of burden sacred to one of their false gods. The statuettes, all the work of dalish artisans during the long walk, were kept in his room in the winter palace. When his daughter ascended to the throne, she had them repurposed as keys. But why? And for what? No one can know. An excerpt from Architectural History of Orlais, Volume 1, by Elodie Fernand. Winter Palace The Grand Library of Halam Shiral. The Winter Palace's collection of book is one of the world's largest. Only the Library of the University of Orlais and the Imperial Palace Library compare. Famed cabinet maker Gustave of Valfontaine designed and built the shelves, the finest examples of his marquetry technique still in existence. Excerpt from the Architectural History of Orlais, Volume 1, by Elodie Fernot. Hmm. The Rochelle Fountain. Emperor Judicile I commissioned this massive fountain to commemorate House Valmont's historic victory against Xavier Dracon. The four lions represent Emperor Alphonse Valmont and his three younger brothers, Duke Isidore d'Arlens, d'Arlesans, Duke Yvonne of Savrain, and Duke Stéphane of Valmontaine, who took the field against the usurper. Excerpt from Architectural History of Orlais, Volume 1, by Elodie Fernot. That for that. Places. Crestwood. Crestwood is a small village of no real consequence to the lords and ladies who ride through on their way to Val Royo or Denerum. The people are glad for visitors, however. Residents tend livestock and grow what crops they can, but their chief income comes from trade. I was dining alone at the local inn, which is quaintly perched on top of a dam, when I overheard the barman mention tunnels beneath the village. I was surprised to learn that a vast cave system riddles the land surrounding Crestwood. 
The locals told me tales of strange noises and eerie lights, of entire expeditions swallowed by the underground fissures, of screams in the dark that come from nowhere and return just as swiftly to nothing. I scoffed and then went for a stroll around the area. The night was clear and I was wending down a pleasant glade in the hills when I heard a rasping hiss. Dropping my walking staff, I spied an overgrown opening to a small cavern. With those footsteps padding away into the dark, I heard then, or a startled animal. That night I let the candle in my room burn longer than usual. From the diary of a traveller from Val Chavon, dated three months before the start of the fifth blight. Three Trout Pond hides a sinkhole hundreds of yards deep. Darkspawn emerged from this and other caves to attack Crestwood during the blight. The flood that destroyed Old Crestwood drowned the Blighted Ones, and the excess water created the pond we see today. Had the dam not been damaged, we never would have survived the Darkspawn. Was the Maker's hand in this? I cannot believe he would be so purposefully cruel to his children, flawed though we are. From the memoirs of Sister Vaughn of Crestwood. Resources found here? Elfruit, Spindlebead, Blood Lotus, Deep Mushroom, Embryum, Iron, Obsidian, Everite. Halam Sharal. After the glorious reclamation of the Dales, the elven capital city lay empty and in ruins for years, a haven for bandits and highwaymen and all manner of miscreants. The land lay unused until the exalted age when Alphonse Valmont, the very lion himself, declared that a palace should be built there in honor of the valiant actions of his brothers in besting the armies of false Emperor Xavier Dracon. Originally called Chateau Lyon, or Chateau Lion, it was designed and as a grand retreat for the Emperor's brothers and their families. The city of Halamsharal grew around the palace. The first records of its existence appear in the Storm Age, when Emperor Cyril granted the title of Marquis to Sir Reginald Montclair for administration of Halamsharal. An elven uprising destroyed Chateau Lyon. In the Blessed Age, when Emperor Judicile I rebuilt it, he named the new retreat the Winter Palace. It was designed more for the Emperor and his immediate family than for any cadet branches of House Valmont, and became the heart of the Imperial Court in the darkest months of winter. An excerpt from Architectural History of Orlais, Volume 1, by Elodie Fernot. Tales A Ghoulish Delight My dearest Regine, Surely you must have heard the Paget's failing fortunes. They have lost almost everything. The Lord made some bad decisions, and trusted people he shouldn't. All that's left is La Maison Verte. In the Dales, they have to sell it and move to the city. I was called upon to find someone willing to buy the house. You would be so proud of me, I surpassed all the Lord's expectations. I looked into La Maison's history first. Did you know it was built in the time of the elves? It was a sanctuary dedicated to Andril, goddess of the forest. The house was built around the ruins. The heart of the shrine was an etched stone altar, now in the Grand Hall. It's quite spectacular. Any noble in Valrio would be envious of something with such historical significance. I planned a party to show off the house and its elven altar. We had it decorated with white flowers and candles, even brought in some hearts to graze the, in the garden outside. The effect was stunning. Then my stroke of genius. Remember when Lady Karen's pastime was reading about elves and how sympathetic she was to what happened in the Dales? She couldn't stop talking about how we must make contact with the restless elven spirits. All her lady companions were so taken with the idea. Well, I did just that, or made the guests believe that's what I what happened. I had to hire a mage to help, of course, a very discreet fellow from Montsamad. During the party, I talked about how the house was a haunt for sad elven spirits. They ate it all up. Romantic, they said. For the final touch, I had everyone join hands around the elven stone and pray, and the mage, no names, cast a spell that made us dance like puppets on strings and sing the little bluebird of summer. It was a triumph. Offers began pouring in. One of them was even from the representative of the Grand Duchess Florian. Oh, I have so much to tell you, I can't wait to return. With great love, Ignatius. Heart and High Town, Chapter 6, by Varric Tethras. The estates of High Town fall into three types. 
the dwarven palaces in their enclave, huddled around their counterfeit paragon statues for shelter against the onslaught of the human ideas that surround them, the foreign quarter, where the wealthiest Orlesian and Antivan merchants stay during their twice-yearly visits to criticize the ship captains and shop clerks and accountants in their employ, and the noble mansions, where families who can trace their lineage back to Orlesian conquerors and Tevinter landlords perch to look down on the rabble of ordinary folk scurrying at their feet. But whoever they belong to, all of the Hightown estates have two things in common— a showy front entrance used when the occupants want to be seen, and a hidden back way when they don't. The servant's door to the Comte de Frevere's mansion was in an alley hidden by overgrown topiaries. Don and Brennikovic picked the lock while his partner, Jevlin, kept an uneasy lookout. They had left their armor at the barracks, but even in civilian clothes, the recruit managed to look like he was wearing an older brother's hand-me-downs. "'I don't think this is what the captain meant when she said to get evidence,' he muttered. The lock clicked, and Donnan gently pushed it open. Only a few slivers of light slid through the shuttered windows. Silence hung in the air like a cheap tapestry. Donnan and Javelin crept through the dark rooms. Alert for any sign of servants, but nothing broke the eerie quiet except their footsteps— in fact, there was no sign that anyone had been in the house at all until they found the room whose door had been torn from its hinges. Inside, the Comte lay in a pool of blood, one hand clutching a loaded crossbow, a dagger hilt protruding from his back. As soon as I get all of the Hardened Hightown chapters, I'm sure I've said this before, uh, I'm gonna read the whole thing. <laughs> I might actually do that anyway, and I'll look it up uh, in the, uh, the wiki. And uh, that's it. Thank you for joining me. And I hope to see you next time when we continue our courtly intrigue through the palace in Halam Shiral. But until then, take care of yourselves. Stay safe. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>